All right. Well, welcome everyone. After a few minutes of troubles, glad you could all make it here for the first uh, conservation sciences seminar of the semester this fall. Um, if you check the chat, I did drop uh, a link to our fall schedule. We're still, we're still working on finalizing uh, some of the dates, but that should mostly be uh, set in stone. Um, a lot of you are probably pretty familiar, but if this is your first time, uh, if you have any questions during the seminar, feel free to drop them in the chat or hold them for Q&A after. And with that, I'm pleased to uh, introduce Dr. Laura Pru. Laura is a professor of quantitative wildlife sciences at the University of Washington and director of the School of uh, Environment and Forest Sciences Genetics Lab. Her research examines the dynamics of wildlife populations and communities with a particular focus on facilitation, trophic interactions, and changing winter ecology. Uh, in recognition of her contributions to carnivore ecology, Dr. Pru received a Presidential Early Career Award in Science and Engineering in 2019, which is the highest honor bestowed by the US government on early career scientists and engineers. And Laura has also shaped a lot of my own work uh, and how I think about carnivore community ecology. So I'm really excited to have her here uh, speaking with all of us. So with that, Laura, please take it away. And all I'll, right. Uh, enable screen um, sharing here as well. Yeah, thank you, Jack. And uh, thanks for the invitation. Um, let's see, hopefully now I can share my screen. Um, oh, here we go. Great. So let's see. And I'm not sure if there are, I don't see, it's been a while since I've given a Zoom presentation. <laughs> um, there used to be like a button to, oh, here we go. Optimize for video sharing. There we go. Okay. Okay. So let's see. Are you guys seeing my presentation now? Yes, looks great. Okay, and is it kind of cutting off the top? Should I hide the meeting control? Yeah, for me, it does seem to be cutting off uh, okay. stuff when I think different windows are being pulled up. Is that better now? There's one in the middle that I think still cut off. Yep, now you're good. Okay, great. Um, yeah, like I, I was uh, mentioning um, before everyone joined that uh, the, for a year after my undergrad, I was a technician in Peter Reich's lab there uh, and at University of Minnesota and have many fond memories from that time. So um, uh, yeah, it's a great place and uh, great to have the opportunity to present to you all. Um, so I'm going to be talking about one of the main themes in my uh, lab, carnivore community ecology today. Uh, and I just want to start by giving you a little more information if my slide will advance. Uh, not sure why it's not. Okay, there we go. A little more about me. Um, so I was born and raised in uh, Maryland, uh, and I decided when I was about 10 years old, uh, I changed my career aspirations from being a doctor and a horse rider to a scientist or a marine biologist or a biologist. Um, and that kind of morphed quickly into wildlife biologist, and I never really wavered from that. And my family was not outdoorsy at all. Um, so I kind of attribute my career path to two main influences. One is my dogs that I grew up with, Killer and Bandit, uh, walking them, playing in the woods with them. Uh, and the other major influence was television. So I was an avid consumer of uh, wildlife documentaries, uh, Jack Cousteau and Marty Stauffer's Wild America at that time. I'm eight, I'm dating myself with this information. Um, so really, I attribute my career path to dogs and television. Um, and, you know, I did worked at University of Minnesota, did 
a bunch of different things and ended up uh, eventually at the University of Washington. And my research lab focuses on wildlife community ecology. So there, we look at a lot of different things, but one of the unifying themes is how species interact with one another. Uh, we tend to use pretty intensive field work approaches often in the winter. And that's something that I'm not going to be talking about today, but another major theme in my lab that I'm pretty excited about is winter ecology and looking at how snow conditions are changing and affecting predator-prey interactions. Um, so uh, as a community ecologist, this is one of my uh, favorite papers and quotes from John Lawton. And um, it's not quite a direct quote, so I'm taking a little liberty here, but in this classic paper, Are There General Laws in Ecology? Uh, John Lawton referred to community ecology as, I think, the middle ground of ecology. And he said, the middle ground is a mess. Um, and uh, I think this this is one of my favorite food webs here. And in the tiny text at the bottom, you can see it says a simplified food web for the North Atlantic. And I think it does a great job at showing how complex uh, system ecosystems are in communities. And what John was arguing is that, you know, when you go to a lower level of complexity, so with population ecology, uh, we can make some pretty robust predictions based on formulas of population growth rates that are generally well understood. And then when you go to a higher level of complexity with macroecology, looking at some global patterns of productivity and diversity and scaling, metabolic scaling rules and things like that, uh, it, we can draw some general conclusions, but when you're at the level of community ecology, uh, he was arguing there's just way too many contingencies uh, and it's basically a hopeless endeavor to try to draw out some general rules. And so he was arguing that we should basically abandon community ecology because we're never gonna get anywhere with it. Um, and I, I think I, I appreciate, I think what he says is basically true, but I, I don't agree with the conclusion that we should abandon it. Um, and for a, a couple reasons, but importantly, uh, I think a lot of conservation decisions and actions happen at the level of community ecology. So they don't tend to happen, policies that affect uh, wildlife don't tend to happen at the global scale. And um, we could approach everything at a species by species level uh, at the population scale, um, but that's very inefficient and species are embedded in communities. Uh, so even though it is messy, I would argue that we really need to dive into that mess and see if there are any um, patterns that are robust, try to identify what those contingencies are. Um, and so I, I think uh, today what I want to do is uh, dive into the mess of carnivore community ecology and with a particular focus on mesopredators. Uh, partly because my favorite species the, is the coyote, which is a mesopredator. And one of the reasons they're my favorite species is because they share these uh, common traits that are common to a lot of mesopredator species where they're centrally positioned in food webs. They have a very generalist diet. And so they tend to be very important species where uh, they are affected by levels above them and they strongly affect a lot of prey species. Uh, so they're, they're strong interactors and can have a very important role in uh, community dynamics. So for decades, a uh, large body of literature has built up uh, about 
how large carnivores often kill or persecute smaller carnivore species, and this can limit their abundance and distribution. Um, and uh, we synthesized this literature, oh, this is a while ago at this point, back in 2009. Um, and as part of this review, we also looked at changes in the distribution of mesopredators and apex predators in North America. And compared to historic times around uh, European colonization, all of the apex predator ranges have, are smaller. So despite some recent recovery trends, um, when you compare to historic ranges, they've all declined. Uh, whereas 60% of the mesopredator ranges have actually increased. And so this map is showing the ratio of mesopredators to apex predators and historically, it was never really more than uh, five mesopredators per apex. And now in a lot of parts of North America, it's much higher. And in a good part, uh, that ratio can't even be calculated because there aren't um, uh, the large apex predators uh, remaining. So um, a few years ago, I googled this paper title to get the DOI for it and was very surprised and somewhat delighted to see that someone had made a video interpretation of the paper. Um, and uh, I'm going to play a little clip for you because it's a lot more fun than uh, reading the paper. Um, and it's a longer video, but I just clipped out the mesopredator part of it. So hopefully this is going to come through the Zoom okay. Um, and Jack or Joe, let me know if it's not. Oh. Skunk, raccoon, mahi, mahi, mongoose, cat shark, dogfish, jackal, large squid. Food chain, food chain, food chain, food chain, food chain, food chain, woof. Apex out, we the new thing. Oof. And we don't need a huge range. Oof. As you get killed by the human, mess with predators gonna move in. Oof. Say goodbye to our old foes. Oof. Yeah, what a relief. Phew. No competition or no hunting. Cool. Mess with predators are released. Oof. When farmers hunt down lions Shoot. just to protect livestock. Move. Nobody left to eat baboons. Baboon. Who start eating all the crops? Oof. Sharks getting killed for the fins. Oof. Boom time for the raisin skates. Oof. But they eat all the bivalves. Oof. Humans left with an empty plate. Poof. Fence out all the dingoes. Shoot. Foxes rise in a blink. Oof. And as the Fox keeps hunting, Ooh. little mammals go extinct. Uh, but we're not just thriving Ooh. due to the apex crash. Boom. Living near humans is rich. Ooh. We're sitting here eating up trash. Rats. Food chain, food chain, food chain, food chain, food chain, food chain, woof. Trophic cascades happen quick with apex gone and we're turned loose. We can't fight by human side. Rise up the food chain till we. Uh. All right. So, uh, boy, I feel like if someone would do that with all the scientific papers, um, we would have a lot more, uh, a lot more fun and a lot more people, um, you know, scientifically literate. <laughs> so um, yeah, that uh, basically summarized the, the gist of that paper, which indicated that large carnivores can play an important role in suppressing the abundance of smaller carnivores. Um, but separately from that literature, there's been another body of literature indicating that these large carnivores can also provide a lot of food to scavengers. And mesopredators are uh, pretty much all of them a scavenge. Um, and so there's this other role that they have of carrion provisioning. And so uh, around the time that I started my first faculty position in 2012, I was faculty at University of Alaska Fairbanks uh, from 2012 to 2015. And so around that time when I was starting up my research program up there, I was really uh, interested in this idea that you can have intergild predation, but also intergild facilitation happening at the same time. And maybe there are some conditions where the net effect would be positive, uh, where the facilitation would be stronger, and other situations where uh, predation would prevail. So that was kind of the mindset 
that I was uh, going into uh, when I set up my research program in Alaska. Uh, and in the course of doing that research, it really caused me to question fundamentally how that dynamic plays out in the role of uh, carrion provisioning and, and carcass sites in these dynamics. Um, it was also very cold up there at times. This photo actually was from my PhD work, which was also up in the Alaska range. But I guess you all are no stranger to those kinds of uh, temperatures. And I want to give a bit of a shout out to my uh, three graduate students who worked on this project, Kelly Sivy, Casey Pazangra, and Kaya Clowder. So we used a variety of different approaches for this project. I'm a big fan of using multiple methods to uh, address research questions. So we were radio collaring wolves and coyotes in, in Denali. So this is uh, on the left there. Um, I'm helping to collar a, a, a 10 month old wolf pup. And then on the right, uh, I'm the one in the white helmet with the bunny boots. I'm not sure if you all ever have wear bunny boots down there, but it's pretty much standard issue footwear in Alaska. Uh, they're from the military and uh, keep your feet nice and toasty warm. Um, so we're coloring a coyote there. Um, and we also were putting cameras up at wolf kills as well as other carcasses that we found that died of other causes to monitor scavenging. And we conducted repeated snow track surveys on uh, transects in two different areas. So kind of took advantage of the state of Alaska's wolf control program as a, a natural experiment where there was a unit, uh, the Sisitna Basin adjacent to Denali, where the state had reduced wolves to about half of their natural densities for the past decade. And so we set up the identical protocols in Denali, where wolves are at natural levels and in the wolf control area, uh, surveying for carnivore tracks. Um, and in the map here, you, you can see there's a little white area. Um, so the Denali Park is in green. And that little cutout is the Stampede Corridor. So if you've read or seen the movie Into the Wild uh, about Alex McCandless going to the bus and dying, that was actually right uh, along one of our snow track transects. Uh, so I've been in the bus, it's kind of creepy. They actually have since moved it to the Museum of the North in Fairbanks because too many people kept trying to hike out to the bus and dying. <laughs> uh, I guess they didn't learn the lesson from Alex, um, but uh, that was kind of a fun little feature of our sampling sites. So one of the things we found when we were looking at the GPS locations of coyotes and wolves and coyote movements in relation to wolf territories uh, here on this map, you, you see the wolf home ranges in the background and then coyote locations in the foreground. And you can see that pattern that's been noted in some other studies where they were kind of filling in the borders of the wolf territories. Uh, but we found a pretty interesting seasonal pattern where when you look at coyote movements in relation to wolf uh, use, in the summer, they avoided wolves. But in the winter, they actually uh, were selecting four areas with higher wolf use. Um, and they also had giant home ranges. So in Texas, the coyote home ranges would be about two orders of magnitude smaller than this. Um, and about one order of magnitude smaller in Washington, and I would imagine uh, in Minnesota as well. So that just indicates how resource poor this system is at the northern edge of their range. Um, and we hypothesize that in the winter, they're especially food limited and the scavenging, they might be selecting for areas with wolves to scavenge 
from their kills because there's very little else to eat. This study also happened during the low phase of a snowshoe hare cycle. So they were particularly hard up for food. And we had a few anecdotal incidents uh, like this one here, which shows uh, the coyote 46F who we were radio collaring in the photo, uh, her locations in yellow, and then the Riley Creek wolf pack. This is the alpha female shown here, their locations in red, and they had made a caribou kill um, and uh, moved away from it. And the, the coyote was scavenging from it. And then the Riley Creek pack came back on October 21st. We got a mortality signal, um, came in and we found her severed head buried in the uh, tundra nearby. Um, and we had, uh, I think, four cases of wolf killed coyotes where this is what we found, where it looks like a mob style hit of a severed coyote head buried in the tundra. So that that was kind of interesting. Um, other times they would just, we would find them and they're just bitten all over. Uh, and they rarely uh, actually, I, I don't think we had any cases where they consumed the coyotes. So this question on the slide, you know, are wolf kills actually functioning as a free meal, which is implied when we talk about it as carrion provisioning, or are they functioning more like bait? Um, so bait might not be quite the right word because they're not consuming the coyotes, uh, but more of like a, an ecological trap where they can't help themselves but come in to scavenge. Um, and that might make them a lot more likely to run into a large carnivore that might kill them. Um, and we found that wolves return to their kills frequency. So when we looked at visits to kills after wolves abandon them and also visits to other uh, carcasses, wolves and wolverines were the top scavengers. Um, coyotes uh, were the next most common scavenger and then uh, followed by red foxes. Um, and here we have uh, uh, an interaction between uh, wolverine and wolves. <laughs> So this was a wolf. And the wolf won that interaction, but uh, you don't see a dead wolverine there. Uh, wolverines, I think, are like the honey badgers of... North America, they're just too badass to <laughs> get killed very often. Um, but uh, um, the wolves do come back frequently, even long after there is nothing left. Uh, so we would leave cameras up at the carcasses for months and find wolves and other carnivores uh, frequently showing up, even when there's really nothing left. Um, they, I think it just smells really good and maybe they have some fond memories. They want to apply a little more perfume rolling in the rumen pile. Um, so uh, we also looked at their movements in this landscape with the uh, uh, track transects. Uh, we looked at this for all of the mesocarnivores in the system. Um, I'm just showing the canids here, but also lynx and uh, marten as well. And um, we were looking at associations between wolves and the mesopredators and also among the mesopredators at two different scales with the track transect data. Uh, so kind of looking at the landscape scale, we can look at uh, the probability of occupancy shown here in uh, Susitna is that wolf control area and lighter colors are lower occupancy, darker colors are uh, higher. Uh, so you can see the wolf control was very effective, um, lot lower wolf 
occupancy in the wolf control area. Uh, coyotes, you can kind of see the reverse pattern, right? Like darker colors, higher occupancy, where wolves have been removed. Red foxes is a little harder to see the pattern visually. Um, but so that's at the landscape scale. We can compare the kind of average occupancy uh, across these large areas. Uh, we can also look at local scale associations. So kind of within Denali, we can look at those individual two kilometer grid cells and say, are grid cells with more wolves? Do they have fewer coyotes and, and uh, vice versa, or like and foxes and so on. Um, so we fed this track data into a structural equation model to tease apart those interactions. And um, this is showing the simplified uh, path coefficients. There was, we also accounted for habitat and snow conditions in this model. Um, and what we found was when we look at that landscape scale, so uh, comparing across the big study areas, pretty much all of those associations are negative. So there was higher occupancy of all the mesocarnivores in the area where wolves had been reduced. Uh, but when we look at the local scale, most of those associations were positive. So we hypothesized from this that the local scale facilitation, um, and this pattern was stronger for those species that scavenge more, um, that that scavenging might be uh, leading to that local scale positive association. And that could be the mechanism actually that leads to a landscape scale suppression. So that kind of led to this fatal attraction hypothesis. But we weren't able to really test that hypothesis uh, with this data. So that got Kelly and I thinking about this and um, wondering if we synthesized these two disparate literatures on scavenging and intergill predation, uh, maybe we would find some patterns that would help to, um, uh, you know, see whether there was more support for this hypothesis or not. Uh, so this was basically a five-year side project that we conducted, and I refer to it as a mega analysis because it contains well, probably like five different meta analyses within it. Uh, we just kind of, um, one thing kept snowballing into the other. It got a little out of hand, <laughs> um, but we eventually did finish it. Um, so we ended up synthesizing 256 studies across the globe in this, um, this study. Uh, and first, the main, first question that we wanted to look at was how important is intergild predation as a source of mortality for smaller carnivores? So we synthesized all the data sets that we could find where uh, people had radio collared mesopredators in areas with large uh, carnivores. Uh, so this ended up giving us estimates for 16 or 17 different mesopredator species. Um, and on average, the intergild killing accounted for about 30%, so about a third of the total intergild mortality. You can see wolverines there was very low. Um, uh, they're just uh, very badass and kind of defy the, um, the uh, patterns here. But um, yeah, so seems to be a substantial source of mortality. Um, one interesting pattern that came out of this is that the uh, intergild mortality rate uh, increased non-linearly with the number of large carnivore species in the system. So in particular, when you went from two large carnivores in the system to three, the intergild mortality rate more than doubled. So that was a super additive uh, increase. And I think Martha and the Vandellas kind of um, summarize why this happens. I'll give you a little musical inter. Um, where, you know, once you start adding um, 
more large carnivores with different hunting modes, different habitat preferences, then it really uh, greatly reduces that enemy free space for the mesopredators. Another interesting pattern we found was uh, in terms of the uh, identity of the large carnivores and the mesopredators. So uh, looking first at the gray bars here, we see if the large carnivore is a cat, uh, a felid, then it really doesn't matter if the mesopredator is another felid or in a, a different family. Uh, the rate of intraguild mortality is basically the same. Um, so cats are basically equal opportunity killers, and they tended to uh, consume the mesopredators uh, a lot more than uh, the canids did. When we look at the black uh, lines on this graph, in contrast, the uh, for if the large carnivore is a dog, uh, a large canid, then the identity of the mesopredator really matters. And they were about the intraguild mortality rate for smaller canids was about five times higher than it was for smaller felids or mustelids um, or other uh, families. Um, so it is, in fact, a dog eat dog world, or I should say a dog kill dog uh, world, because uh, they often don't consume them. Uh, so kind of learned some interesting things about intraguild mortality seems to be an important cause of mortality for mesopredators. Uh, and then we wanted to look at scavenging. So first we were interested in knowing kind of how much carrion are large carnivores leaving for uh, mesopredators and other scavengers. So we synthesized studies on large carnivore kill rates and estimated kind of how estimates of how much they leave behind for scavengers. And this is very rough and obviously depends on a lot of different factors, but uh, roughly on average, each individual apex predator provides about 1300 kilograms of carrion for scavengers each year. So that sounds like it, you know, is a non-trivial amount of uh, biomass, um, but it's a little hard to know sort of how that compares to other food sources, how important that might be. So we also uh, then wanted to know, well, how important is carrion as a, um, in the diet of mesopredators? So we synthesized studies of mesopredator diets in areas with uh, provisioning large carnivores um, and found that on average, it represented about 30% of the diet of mesopredators. So uh, a substantial amount. Um, and there was a significant effect of body size where larger mesocarnivores tended to scavenge more than smaller ones. Okay, so we have, you know, these indications, the mortality is important, but also uh, these mesopredators scavenge a lot. So what are the net effects? Um, and so we compiled studies that looked at abundance uh, relationships between larger and smaller carnivores uh, to see, you know, is that relationship typically negative um, or positive or no effect? And what we found was the grand mean across these studies was negative, so negative 0.34, indicating that on average, uh, large carnivores do suppress the abundance of mesopredators. Uh, but you can see there's there were quite a few studies there that had uh, positive effects. Um, and one of the main factors that stood out here was actually the spatial scale of the study area. Um, so the correlation between uh, large and small carnivores tended to be positive when the study area was less than a thousand square kilometers, uh, and it tended to be negative if the study area was larger than that. So I think this gets at that kind of fatal attraction idea where when you're looking at a finer spatial scale, 
you might be capturing those positive associations either due to scavenging or coincidental habitat selection. Um, and so to really look at suppression or test for a suppressive effect, I think that study area needs to be uh, much larger. All right, so um, you know we learned some interesting things from that synthesis, but we also found that there were very, very few studies that looked at intraguild predation and scavenging in the same study. In fact, I'd, I'm not sure if we actually found any um, that did. And so that provided kind of the motivation for the mesopredator side of the Washington Predator Prey Project, uh, which uh, ran from 2017 to 2022. And this was a big collaborative project that uh, was mainly aiming to understand the effect of recolonizing wolves uh, in Washington and how they're uh, affecting other species outside of protected areas. So the main focus of the broader study was on uh, their impacts on ungulates, um, but I uh, obtained some additional funding from NSF to add mesopredators to this uh, project. And so uh, the originally I set out with this project where we have all these different species collared, we're gonna have a lot of information about ungulate kills, um, to understand if there are linkages between uh, the amount of scavenging that an individual mesopredator does and its likelihood of getting killed by large carnivores. Um, wolves naturally began recolonizing Washington uh, starting in 20, 2008. So it's been fairly recent, uh, but their numbers have grown um, pretty rapidly. Uh, this map shows the their distribution in 2018, so towards the beginning of our study. Uh, we had two study areas, and initially the northeast study area had a lot more wolves than the north central study area, but by the end of the project that north central study area had actually filled in um, pretty well and had a similar number of wolves. Uh, this was a big project with uh, Beth Gardner and Aaron Worsing at UW, and also Brian Kurtzen and Malia DeVivo at Washington Fish and Wildlife, as well as a, a number of uh, graduate students and postdocs who worked on this project, and I think 54 um, seasonal field technicians, uh, so really big effort. Um, and I'm not going to be talking about the ungulate side of things, but just want to highlight um, my former student, Taylor Gans, who headed up the ungulate work, um, published some pretty cool papers on uh, elk, white-tailed deer, and mule deer uh, responses to wolves, cougars, and people um, in the system. Uh, so I'm going to focus on the mesopredator side. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we set out to look at that fatal attraction hypothesis. One of the interesting features, though, of the Washington Predator Prey Project is that they were both of those study areas. They're quite large. They're each 5,000 square kilometers. They were located outside of protected areas. So there was um, hunting, logging, recreating, cattle grazing, ranching, um, all kinds of human activities happening in both of those study areas. Um, and so it presented a really interesting opportunity to understand how large carnivores, whether they can suppress mesopredators outside of parks. So in our synthesis, about 70% of those studies occurred within protected areas where large carnivores um, you know, are relatively unconstrained by people. Um, and there's been a fair amount of skepticism of whether large carnivores can suppress prey and mesopredator populations outside of protected areas where people really constrain their distribution and abundance. Um, so we wanted to look at that question as well with, with this project. 
So our main questions in, in that regard were, number one, what was the perception of mesopredators? Are they more scared of large carnivores or of people? Um, and what's the reality? Uh, do people or large carnivores kill uh, more mesopredators? Uh, so we're focusing on both coyotes and bobcats for uh, this project. Um, we use GPS collaring to address this question of uh, wolves, cougars, coyotes, and bobcats. Um, my daughter Evelyn is there helping to collar a coyote. I think she's administering fluids there. She got herself off of the butt thermometer um, duty that day. Um, and we put together this little video of um, that hopefully is going to load here of collaring a bobcat. Um, and uh, let's see. So he recovered pretty quickly. Um, let's see here. Let's see if we can get away from not go down a YouTube wormhole. There we go. Okay. And let me hide the meeting controls again. And um, that should go away. Great. Um, so First, we wanted to look at the uh, large carnivore movements to see if they were indeed avoiding people the way we expected them to. So we looked at their uh, movements in relation to the human footprint index, and we did find what we expected, that cougars and wolves avoided areas with a uh, higher human footprint. So this created a a human shield that we expected the mesopredators could use to avoid large carnivores. Um, so what did the coyotes and bobcats do? So we looked at their movements in relation to, um, I don't know why it's not advancing. Okay, here we go. So I'll just show the coyote results for simplicity. Uh, bobcats had similar patterns. So when we look at coyotes, they avoided strongly avoided core wolf home ranges um, and also avoided cougar home ranges uh, to a lesser extent. Uh, what was really interesting was when we looked at their uh, selection for the human footprint uh, in the blue here shows their selection when uh, wolves were absent um, and we see they had slight avoidance, so their peak use was slightly negative on the human footprint index scale. Uh, but when wolves were nearby, they shifted their use uh, markedly towards um, areas with a higher human footprint. Um, and the same was true for bobcats. They actually showed even a more dramatic shift, mainly because they avoided people even more strongly than coyotes did in the absence of large carnivores. Uh, and the response to cougars was very similar as well. So they shifted their use of, uh, to uh, their peak use was about twice as high on the human footprint index when large carnivores were present. 
So that behavior indicates that they perceived large carnivores as being scarier than people. Otherwise, that behavioral response wouldn't make sense. Um, if they thought people were scarier than large carnivores, then they should strongly avoid uh, areas with people um, all the time, regardless of what the large carnivores are doing. Um, but when we looked at the causes of mortality, we found that uh, humans were three to four times a higher of uh, cause of mortality than large carnivores were. Uh, so humans in orange here uh, and uh, large carnivores in red. Um, and so this strategy seemed to be very effective at reducing mortality from large carnivores, um, but it may have contributed to the high uh, rates of being killed by people. Um, so we, the, they were using the human shield, but in this case, it was highly lethal. So getting at that question of whether large carnivores can suppress mesopredators outside of parks, this indicates kind of indirectly, yes, um, kind of within a synergistic way with people. Uh, so this might be one case where uh, wolves and and uh, ranchers have something in common in their hatred of coyotes um, and may unwittingly be working together in some of these rural landscapes to keep their numbers in check. Um, we, because so few uh, coyotes and bobcats were killed by large carnivores, we actually couldn't look at, test the fatal attraction hypothesis very uh, easily. Uh, as we had hoped to kind of at that individual level. Uh, we did this um, looking at their, we collected a lot of scats and looking at their diet um, did provide some support. This was an undergraduate project and I'm just showing the ungulate part of uh, the coyote diet, uh, which was the number one item overall in their diet. And it was mainly in the winter um, but looking both outside and inside wolf home ranges, the ungulate in the diet was much higher inside the wolf home ranges. And then this study used data from the beginning of the project um, where the study areas differed in wolf density. And we saw the same pattern where there was a lot more ungulate in their diet in the high higher wolf density study area. Um, so this kind of provided some support for, even though we saw with the collar data that coyotes tended to avoid uh, the wolf territories, uh, for the coyotes that didn't, um, they seemed to be scavenging. So kind of to wrap things up, making sense of this uh, mess of carnivore community ecology, um, I think there's mounting evidence that scavenging may indeed amplify interguild predation uh, as opposed to being just kind of a free meal or a benefit from scavenging mesopredators. Um, and I think this paradigm of uh, this kind of enemies with benefits paradigm extends to humans as well. So in our study area, humans were kind of acting as that third uh, large carnivore reducing the enemy free space for the mesopredators and also uh, serving as a, there's also that attraction um, through the anthropogenic food sources. So like one of our bobcats was killed after killing 17 chickens, um, for example. So there's also that aspect as well. Um, so just to highlight some uh, kind of Cool unanswered questions. Um, I think it would be great if we could get at this fatal attraction hypothesis more at the individual level. Um, are individuals that scavenge more uh, at higher risk of getting killed by large carnivores? Um, and then the fitness consequences of scavenging um, are not well known. So how much does scavenging increase the risk of intraguild predation and how much does it benefit um, uh, scavengers by, um, you know, providing resources? And then how might this change 
with the productivity of the ecosystem. So we might expect the scavenging to be more important and maybe more beneficial in uh, systems with low productivity. All right, so with that, I will leave you with this cute um, uh, uh, white-tailed deer uh, fawn who, um, and now I, I might, you know, ruin your afternoon by telling you that this little guy got killed by a coyote. Um, so uh, let's see. Let's see. A cute, a cute little downer there at the end. Um, all right, so I think I will stop sharing. And it looks like Craig has a question. First off, that's great work. It's great to see you again. Last time I saw you, you were poking in my office. Uh, not sure whether you're going to do wolves, as I recall. Yep. And you're glad, glad to see you've done so well with everything. My, my, I have a lot of questions, but the one I want to really get to first is with that human shield, are the animals coming in generally at night when they would be safer from people? That's a great question. And, you know, the models were too complicated. We initially wanted to include a temporal component to look for that, but it just made the models too complex. So we weren't able to look at that um but um that is a great a great idea for kind of reanalyzing that data maybe simplifying some of the other aspects so we could look at that because we did find that with elk that elk were uh coming into the ag fields and the you know areas with people at night and then going into the forest in the day um yeah so I would expect that might be similar for the muso predators. Uh, looks like Clarence has a question. Hi, can you hear me now? Um, yeah, I didn't couldn't quite find the raise hand thing here. Anyway, this is just a comment on your very early slide, the one where you showed the complicated patterns, and so. This is um, related to how complex things get fast and how theory then fails. And so uh, it's long been known that there are, you know, if you have two species, there's three ways, three main ways they can interact. You know, plus minus is predator prey, minus minus is competition, plus minus is mutualism. But when there's three species, then we figured out with a little bit of work that there's 40 ways, 40. <laughs> and that's published in a bioscience article from the beginning of the pandemic. But last year, we wanted to explain to students this whole process that you were explaining. And so we tried to work out, we we worked, we did work out how many ways there are for four species and five. And so it goes from one, it goes from three to 40 to four, four species. It's about 3,000 ways of interacting. And for five species, it's, um, let's see. It's twenty five thousand. It's we know the exact number, but something like twenty. So you see how that goes up so rapidly, so that you go from mathematical treatments when you have just a few species. So you have to use computers when you get a few more species. But then beyond that, you're stuck, and you can't even use computers in the complicated ones, like you were explaining. Anyway, I just wanted to say that we now know how rapidly that goes up, and yeah. it does support this idea. By the way, we couldn't figure out. Uh, the the five species one so we asked ai if it could figure it out and it couldn't figure it out but then wow. in back, and, back and forth communications jointly we figured it out that's amazing yeah yeah <laughs> that's uh so anyway I, I only that's not published anywhere i did present it in class uh to students to show them you know where we we go from community you go from populations to communities and what happens so anyway, I just thought I'd point that out since that's a recent result, part of which only is published. And thank you so much for this really interesting presentation. Oh, thanks. And I hope you do publish that. That's really amazing how quickly it becomes intractable. <laughs> yeah, it grows up uh, sort of way, I mean, way faster than exponential. Mm -hmm.
And then Laura, it looks like we do have one question from uh, Whitney in the chat on if the human caused fatalities from the lethal human shield also include vehicles and then other death besides hunting and shooting. Right, uh, great question. Only one of the 72 collared meso predators was hit by a car. Uh, it was one coyote. And otherwise, pretty much all the coyotes were shot. Um, and most of the bobcats were trapped for their fur. So those were by far the most common causes of death. Yeah, Joe? Yeah, great talk, really stimulating. Um, I'm working with a former graduate student uh, for a few years on this project where we monitor scavenging use of um, deer gut piles, this awful mm -hmm. wildlife watching project with Dr. Ellen Candler. Um, and one thing, we, we published a little note where it looks like raptors are coming in and using it as a hunting ground. For, for small mammals that are feeding at the carcass. They may be scavenging, the raptors may be scavenging the carcass as well, particularly owls at night seem to be doing this. So it's really intriguing to me, like the the idea of the, the fatal attraction hypothesis. And I'm wondering if you've explored at all in the behavioral ecology, the demography of the individuals that return, what age, what sex, who returns and hangs out potentially when the the lion's share of of biomass is gone and who may be using it um in that way mm -hmm. um that resource hotspot as a killing ground do you have yeah. data you peeked at that that is super cool um i would love it i i don't think i saw that note so um i'll have to look that up because that that's really neat <laughs> um i would expect i would not expect wolves because they it seems like their main motivation because they're really kind of they're mainly killing coyotes they even you know i their predation rates on like one level down on foxes they seem to not bother to kill foxes that often um uh and they don't eat the coyotes so i think they're you know, they seem pretty happy to kill coyotes. Like you see them tearing the videos of them tearing into coyotes in Yellowstone, they're wagging their tails. And so maybe they think it's really fun. Um, but uh, I'm not sure I would expect them to be sort of camping out nearby, sort of waiting to pounce on something. But a cougar <laughs> might like be sort of... Um, you know, kind of lurking nearby, waiting to see what might come scavenge and kind of add it to the pile. Um, uh, so yeah, in terms of demography, I mean, they kind of, cougars will hang out until the carcass is either they get bumped by a bear or something or it's pretty well gone. And I think they will just opportunistically kill scavengers that come if they get the opportunity to. Um, yeah. And did you have any individuals, just a quick follow-up on the scavenging side that seemed to be odd, maybe as, as defined by like, they didn't, they avoided carcasses, maybe like older and experienced coyotes that seemed to be like, you know, they had the opportunities in their landscape and they just avoided them. Yeah. I wish we could look at that more. I would love to have a map of all the carcasses on the landscape. Yeah, <laughs> and we, perfect, we no. have a good idea, like in the cougar home ranges, the algorithms for predicting which clusters were kills were pretty good. So within a cougar's home range, a collared cougar, we can have a pretty good idea of like where the uh, ungulates are that they were killing. And then for the mesopredators that occur in those home ranges, we could see maybe like how often are they hitting those sites. For the wolves, because we had four hour fix intervals and it's, you know, the wolf packs would blow through a deer like where 
you know, you'd have to be going to one location clusters to find the deer. So it didn't work at all. The cluster algorithms like did not work well. Um, uh, and then there's the like other causes of death and, and whatnot. Um, but we are hoping like the next step for that data is to use all the scats. We genotype them in a spatial mark recapture framework to see how uh, wolf and cougar, um, how they seem to affect coyote density. So that would be sort of like integrating. And we can look a little bit at some of them. We have enough scats to look at individual diet, um, but I doubt there's enough of a matchup of, oh, those scats came from a collared animal and we know its fate. Um, yeah, so that's, it's so tricky to, I think one reason this, it hasn't been done uh, really uh, is that it, it's very hard with these wide ranging species. Thanks, especially for the extended discussion. Yeah, I've got a, another question that's probably in the same vein of a tricky question to try and solve. Um, and it's kind of in lines with thinking about the adaptability adaptability of meso carnivores, meso predators to apex carnivores on the landscape. So in Yellowstone, we had some early population data that showed a pretty stark drop in coyote abundance after wolf reintroduction. Um, and I wish we had more data and had some collared coyotes to sort of test stuff and population estimates. But anecdotally, it seems like some of the meso carnivore populations have actually recovered since then and are sort of doing much better and maybe aren't facing as much um, mortality from apex carnivores, at least from wolves than they used to. And I was curious if you saw in any of your sort of meta analyses or any stuff with the Washington recolonization project, if there was any sort of that maybe learning to mitigate those risks and adapting to wolves on the landscape and and maybe being more savvy going into carcasses when they scavenge, when they don't scavenge, um, those sorts of things. Yeah, I mean, that's a great observation. And I would imagine that could easily happen. I mean, coyotes are so adaptable and smart. Um, when you saw the bobcat trap, you know, how you trap a bobcat, like you could never catch a coyote that way. They're way too smart. <laughs> um and so I think they could quickly learn and you might easily find that, that in the initial stages of wolf expansion or recovery, that um, the coyotes might be a bit naive to the risks um, and then they would learn and be able to exploit um, the wolf kills more effectively. Um, uh, yeah, uh, it's a shame in Yellowstone that early coyote data was never really published. Um, yeah. That would, it was a real missed opportunity to look at that over, over time and how that might change. Um, yeah, that's been interesting. Yeah, in Washington, I, I think it could be neat to, to track this over time. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, let's see. Craig has another question. Um, I just wanted to ask, uh, there was one of your graphs uh, that showed hyenas at the far right with the amount of carpus, carcass material. I'm not sure I understood what that was actually saying. Because I always get the impression that hyenas eat everything, including the bones. So was that saying they left behind a lot or they relied on a lot? So yeah, the hyena that was saying that they um, that they killed a lot. Oh. Um, and that became and that a was there was a a study that seemed kind of like an outlier, like a super high kill rate. Um, I can't remember offhand which study it was. It wasn't one of yours. <laughs> um, and. Uh, we looked at it and just, I mean, it looked fine. There wasn't any issue we could think of to exclude it. And so we included it. 
there weren't, there were only like 24 estimates, like across all those large carnivores where people had estimated how much the large carnivore left when it abandoned the carcass for scavengers. And so we couldn't include that as a species specific variable. So we basically just took the average of that, which was like on average, they leave, I think like 28% of a carcass. Uh, you know, we just kind of applied that across the board. So I think that's a big source of uncertainty. And that's actually something we saw even just within a species with wolves in when we, we, could barely put up any carcasses at wolf kills in Washington because they would just polish up those deer carcasses. And really the only ones we could was when they'd kill moose. Um, that was really the only time they'd leave enough for scavengers. So I think like probably in a deer system, um, like you guys have there, the wolves might be leaving a lot less for scavengers than like up in Alaska where they're killing moose. Um, for example. So one other question, uh, I kept my hand up. Uh, and one of the things that's always baffled me, and I have a proposed solution, but I want to hear what you think, is that uh, whenever I would see a lion chasing a cheetah or trying to kill a cheetah, I thought it was the dumbest thing they could possibly do. Because the cheetah are so timid, they're not at all you know, they're never successful in feeding competition with a lion. And yet if lions get a chance, they'll kill them. And uh, so it's not like there's any feeding competition. In, in fact, I've always been surprised that lions didn't try to domesticate cheetah. If they were really the king of beasts, they'd keep a few cheetah around in their royal court, yeah. right? That would make more sense. So uh, does anybody, and actually there's several people here who look at conflict between different species. Do any, any of you guys see anything similar in any other species combination that the, the top carnivore is just evil? <laughs> <laughs> that is that your hypothesis that no, no, that's not lions my hypothesis. Are... I, I have an ecological hypothesis, which are okay. <laughs> I, I did some experiments and I put out uh, toy cheetah, uh, toy lion cubs in front of cheetah and they kill them. And so I think that the cheetah are basically passive aggressive. <laughs> and if they ever find the uh, baby lions, they will predate on them, prey upon them. And so the lions are getting rid of a predator of their cubs, that that's the motivation, that if they kill anything that might look likely kill their cubs, and it's a very low cost to kill the cheetah, so why not? Yeah, that that's really cool. And I think reproduction and the juvenile age class is a super, super understudied and overlooked part of this dynamic. Like I, you know, there's so few studies of reproduction and, you know, and we did find that with um, some, you know, one of the wolf packs killed a bunch of coyote pups. Like, I, you know, I think that could be one of the main way reasons why coyotes will avoid the wolf areas in the summer is that it would be really dumb to establish a, a coyote den in an area where there's lots of wolves because if they find that den they're going to kill the pups um and and that's an opportunity with that age class for a reverse of the dominance you, where you can get the subordinate carnivore if they can manage to sneak in and and kill the cubs of a dominant um mm -hmm. yeah that that's a neat neat theory but yeah it might be just that lions are stupid assholes like you know well okay so an alternative until i did the test with the toys my assumption was that lions couldn't distinguish between cheetahs and leopards because they're both spotted cats because we do know for a fact that leopards are predators on lion cubs and, and almost any other carnivore. So they they actually have a motivation because they're like a, a an important predator on domestic dogs in much of the world, et cetera. So I thought, yeah, lions are just too stupid. But then I put out the toy in front of the cheetah and they're just as awful. So nobody's good. They're all awful. <laughs> Murder them all. <laughs> Craig, do, do 
cheetahs in your experience scavenge a lot at, at lion kills or next to nothing no never uh -uh. yeah because the one of the other hypotheses out there that for driving social, you know, it's it's scavenging that's driving that sociality. So they're defending it collectively for extension. Yeah, people have, that are related, people have proposed but... that people have proposed that for spotted hyenas, and the data that I have in my in my new book, I'll sell it now, where I also <laughs> talk about the cub killing hypothesis in cheetah, uh, is that. Um, the data we have, the only time female lions, because it's only females that lose, lose carcasses to, to hyenas, uh, but I actually could calculate from the data we had that they would lose more from having a second lion with them than they lose to hyenas. So, you know, if you're with the second lion, you're going to have to divide that carcass in two. But if hyenas are there, they don't show up that often. And, and they basically, what you see in reality is that they wait the hyenas are kind of waiting till there's almost nothing left and the female's already eaten her fill. So that's when she kind of gives up. So no, <laughs> not for lions and defending their carcasses anyway. All right. Um, any other, right, any other questions? Looks like that's maybe it. All right, well, thank you again so much, Laura, for taking the time to, to give this wonderful talk. Great. Definitely well, thank... gave me a lot of ideas for my work. So. Yeah, well, thanks for the information. It was, I mean, sorry, the invitation. <laughs> it was great to see you all. And little, uh, I see Dave Meach there, uh, who I haven't seen since he came up and gave a talk at UA when I was at UAF. So, um, hi, Laura. Great talk. Uh, thanks, Dave. <laughs> Great. A lot of accolades right. in the chat box about your yep. chat window about your, your effective concert, um, communication and some of the great stuff. So thanks for sharing that dynamic. Yep. A lot of people asking for the, the video. Uh, I the think I found the video paper. link and yeah. shared it with everyone. So, yeah. <laughs> Awesome. <laughs> That's top shelf. Have a great, great weekend. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Yep. Thanks again. Zach, you going to hang on? Yeah. Yeah, I'll hang on. <laughs>